And we're back with some more Dyson Sphere program. And this beautiful little monstrosity here, this thing, it produces fuel rods from raw resources. And it produces 480 of them. Uh, to put that in, say, power terms, uh, I think that's about 69,120 megawatts of power if we were to burn those. Um, so let's just check over here. Currently, this whole thing consumes about 1.1 to 1.2 gigawatts of power. So this thing is generating far more power than it needs. Less than 2% of the power it generates goes into actually running it. And it's not so much generation. What we're doing is we're converting photons that we drew down somewhere else from energy generation and converting them into a portable fuel source. People seem a bit confused about why we do that, but we'll get around to that later. I want to sort of... Um, show you how this thing evolved, because this thing returned a little bit different than I was planning. Originally I was just planning to do my normal, uh, let's make a vertical bus and have everything go across it. But, uh, let's go back here through the abandoned child ch children over here that's just, uh, yeah. I, I tried a bunch of different things to make this work, and eventually I settled on that fire design over there. This here was our first attempt. I basically started chucking things down. I didn't connect anything up. I wanted to see how, well, how much space it would take up, where I could squeeze it in, what the breakpoints would be, if it was, you know, even viable. This thing was pretty messy. And there had been another thing I'd wanted to play around with, and it was this, the pizza slice building. Now, pizza slice building sounds a bit weird, but it's to do with the way the planets are aligned here. So, for example, see right here. There is, this line here keeps continuing on straight. These next ones don't, but every five bunches, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, it lines up again. So this section from here all the way to here is a pizza slice. It basically links all the way to the top of the map and all the lines continue straight up. Now, I didn't want to use it specifically to give us more space, but just more of a case of, I kind of like the idea of fitting things into blocks like that because it makes them much more usable. So what if I was to say, put all of the uh, the big miniature particle colliders that break up the light sections up the top, how many could we fit in, how much space would they take up, what happened if we doubled up? You see, what I wanted to do here was, instead of using 50 tiles, we'd use, well, 100 tiles. 100 tiles would give us twice the pizza slice to work with, and maybe we could use the top above it for stuff as well. And after trying to squeeze all of this stuff in, we got all the way to the end, and all I needed to do was put in another row of antimatter fuel cells. Well, actually, there would have been a little bit more. This antimatter fuel cell production would have been perfect. Problem was, I needed to bring these around the side, and we were just about to hit, like, that's tile 50. And one of the rules of, well, my self-imposed rule was, I can't put anything on the outermost edges, so these things have to be free for power poles, so that I could put, I could mirror the build and put it on the opposite side. And the edges, same thing, power poles. So this was about three tiles too wide. And the problem is really these, uh, oh, these thingies here. These miniature particle colliders are awesome, but they have a few minor quirks when we're building lentwa. Uh, instead of building horizontally, we're building vertically, which results in this problem. See, we put those guys up like that. Great. And then what we want to do is put another batch on the other side. So we put them touching, and yeah. They basically run into each other once they hit a certain point. It's because the, the, the map is converging the closer you get to the top of the map, and while the amount of squares you have are the same, the buildings start clipping into each other and it causes issues. So this is why these are so spread out and why we got to put power poles in places and it was awkward. So that's what led to the next design, which is... Oh, one second, we'll make sure there's a clear de delineation here between these. These guys over here, what we did was we put in one batch and then you'll notice here we're able to put power poles in between these buildings. So assemblers, you can squeeze in power poles in between them. In fact, you can put in... Um, like little transport belts as well, they're very useful that way. You cannot do the same with the smelters, but then all we did was we recessed the smelters by one because they were the same as the assemblers, and yeah, there was some things going on here. There was going to be two inputs going into some of these and things, and this meant we were able to put power poles in here, which meant this thing was... We basically had removed a power pole option for this, and then on the opposite side, we just made sure that the power poles that would have been placed on the opposite side of this are instead held in by other buildings. And this cut down on space waste. And just squishing all of these up, we managed to get to the point where just over here, you notice, we are... Oop, one time, we actually ended up with an entire extra tile of space, which was incredible, and the whole thing fitted inside the, 50, the 100 tiles. So you'll see here that line continues straight up to the top of the map, and over here, same thing. Now, I ended up not using the top half of the pizza slice, which is pointless, but... I mean, at this point, you're so committed to the design ideology, like, you just can't stop. You've got this idea of what you want to build, you just you can't not do it. So we took that design, we had to make a few changes here to actually route and belt and get everything working. Uh, this is 
I know this looks terribly confusing, but I think the, the thing I like the most is uh, this manifold or splitter or whatever. This brings in the uh, the proliferator Mark III. It goes into a splitter, and then that feeds two more splitters, which, well, okay, so that goes from one to two, and then it goes from two to four, and then from four to eight. So we're quickly able to spread out that proliferate all the way across. And even then, this thing goes up to nine. There are nine belts stacked on top of each other here, because, actually, no, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, wait, seven? Why is there... Then why do I need to... Oh, wait, yes. I had to put branch two of these over here. Reason being is these two are on the edges, and we can't run any belts through here, because this is reserved exclusively for power bowls. Remember, we've got to make sure this thing is uh, pasteable beside each other. We can take one of these and place it right beside... Like, we could grab this one here, copy the whole thing, go over the other side, and paste another one right beside it. And since it's a hundred tiles, and the whole planet is a thousand tiles around, you can place ten of these above the equator, and ten of these below the equator meaning you can stick 20 of these onto a planet. We'll, we'll go through numbers on that later. Uh, you may be wondering what this weird... What, why do we have thermal power genet plants over here? This seems like such a waste. And um, I suppose it kind of is a waste of space. But we managed to be really efficient about this. Because this whole thing fed off uh, just basic resources. Uh, except for proliferator Mark III and space warpers. So, well, we also have to import photons. So photons, critical photons are imported, space warpers are imported, and proliferator Mark III. All those things are imported. Everything else? No. Oh, and uh, this here is a satellite. Or was it power satellite thingy? Yeah, these power satellites are cool and all that, but I didn't want to use them. It's just this thing over here can only be powered by a satellite because it's too tall. Once you get above a certain height, you have to use a satellite to power your uh, uh, proliferator application devices. Kind of annoying. But basically, raw resources go down. Raw resources go down, get proliferated on. The finished product comes back up and gets proliferated on. And then this is crammed in the middle to save on power pole space. And the other ones were put on the end because we didn't need to do that. And where is it? Ah, damn here. Here we have quantum chemical plants working on fire ice to give ourselves graphene. We need the graphene to make these pink particle containers. Problem is, this hydrogen, well, there's no natural consumer of it in this build. So all that hydrogen is sent over here to be burned off. So the point of failure in this is, if you're generating too much power on the planet, these generators won't burn enough. Now, this thing is built with a nicely nice balance of power. So we've definitely got enough sufficiency, a little bit to help boot up and stuff like that. So it shouldn't be an issue. But, yeah, you know what? That doesn't matter. What does matter is this thing looks absolutely cool. And it's so self-contained, it fits. It basically hit all the design requirements I wanted. The only really dead space is over here. We need to fit in these, um, oh, what do you call them? Annihilation constraint viewers. They're required to make the antimatter fuel rods. And, uh, well, yeah, they had to go in here, and I didn't want to put in the belts on this side. It seemed kind of pointless to duplicate the belts, so this is all fed from one side. There is a little bit of a weird belt fooey thing, where it goes across and down the other side to feed onto the output belt. But, by and large, this thing's mostly pretty sane. M mostly. By my standards, anyway. Your standards will probably vary a lot. So, why did we go through all this trouble? Well, ease of use, basically. It's a... it's... Let's kind of just go through what the power of this is and the strength and why we do this, why we go to all this effort. First up, that's 480 antimatter fuel rods. That's a lot. And once they're proliferated on, this comes up a lot. People are saying proliferate your fuel rods and increases their efficiency. Uh, yes and no. If you proliferate a fuel rod, it actually burns twice as hard, as in instead of getting 72 megawatts out of your artificial stars, you get twice that at 144 megawatts. However, a candle that burns twice as bright burns only half as long. It actually burns the antimatter fuel rods twice as quickly. I know that sounds crazy, but whoa, what's that button? That is cool. I didn't know that existed. Never mind. Um, I'll have to do some more research on that one. But what that means is proliferating doesn't actually improve power generation, but I'm still going to proliferate them on the grounds that it makes the artificial stars take up, well, produce twice as much power for half the footprint, and I want to remain consistent across everywhere. So that's why the fuel cells are going to proliferate. It doesn't actually help them in any way, shape, or form. The first question that always comes up is, why don't we just, you know, build a Dyson Sphere in the same system as the planet we're running this so that we can power the whole system off the Dyson Sphere in this planetary system and that would save us a whole bunch of power. Why are we bothering to take photons from, where is it, Big Blue over here, ship them all the way to antimatter fuel cells and then convert them to, to fuel cells? Why bother? Well, it's to do with luminosity. This here is the luminosity of this star. It's 1.473. The lumen, that determines how much energy is generated by solar sails and, well, Dyson spheres in general. Big Blue over here has a luminosity of 2.7, almost twice what this 
star system has. So if we build solar sails over here or launch rocket ships over here, they're twice as efficient. They generate twice as much power. Now, given enough time, of course, we could just build twice as much here. And in that time frame, uh, eventually it would just be more efficient because we wouldn't have to ship stuff and we could draw them directly from the system. But that takes a whole bunch of time. In fact, it would take twice as much building of Dyson Sphere. If, if we have the building of the Dyson Sphere, we can kind of speed things along. And then there's, well, the resource costs. How much is this going to cost? How long is this going to run for? We're spending resources on this power. We're not actually creating power here. All we're doing is taking the photons that we could have turned into electricity directly and then converting them to antimatter fuel rods, which we can then burn remotely. We haven't actually generated anything. Like, proliferate's not helping us anywhere along this production chain. However, um, first off, we're consuming power to do this, which is actually eating into our power production as well. We lose about 1.7% in the transition. Uh, roughly. Which, okay, we're burning some of that power. But we're saving so much in terms of the, the Dyson Sphere we're building is so much more efficient than one we could build anywhere else. So I would consider that not really a thing I'm going to be concerned about. And as for the resource amounts, well, this planetary system here has all the resources we need but one. Uh, all we need to build this is iron ore, copper, silicone, titanium, uh, fire ice, and acid. We do not have acid in this planetary system, though there is one really close by. And that would be Big Blue. Big Blue actually has sulfuric acid on it, which means this place is nicely close by. Next thing, though, is to figure out what's going to run out first. And that was actually not so bad. All we did was we took all of the resources we had. Oh, sorry about that fog thing. We're in a sandbox mode, so I'm ignoring all those attacks. So the first thing I did to figure out how long it was going to be before we ran out of resources, assuming we exclusively stuck to this system, was I basically grabbed all those resources and divided them by the amount of resources that would be consumed by our build. Now, uh, the numbers I'm showing you here are just for our end game build, but to start I was kind of deciding between putting down 24 of these miniature particle capaciters, or 36, or 48, or how many it was going to use. But by and large, it was just a quick way to figure out which resource was going to run out first if we exclusively pulled in the system. And the answer is actually iron ore. Turns out this is a very iron intensive process. It's about 40% of the, the entire production is all iron. Uh, copper came in second, then came, I think it was silly, you know what? It doesn't make a difference. What was important was we were going to run out of iron first. How quickly were we going to run out of iron, assuming no efficiency? Well, it was something like, oh, 912 hours. That, that, was, that was my original assessment, about 912 hours is how it would take long to run out for this, this one build, which seems like a long time. However, bear in mind, we can spread this across the entire planet. Also, that's not taking into account mining efficiency. Uh, our current mining efficiency on our main planet, the one, like, the one we should be using is, ah, 10.78%, as in the amount of mining ore we lose. So those original numbers, they were just the rough guesstimates. However, if we uh, reduce the cost down by taking into account our mining ore efficiency, that total amount of hours goes from 912 to 8,500 hours, or 354 days. Um, yeah, so almost an entire year using just one of these builds, which is fine. If we build 20 of them, let's just say we cover this entire planet in these, basically equator to equator, all the way around, two on each side, that would be 17 days. We would be able to run this for 17 days straight before we exhausted the resources in this system. And the way I have configured this system is actually quite nice. You see, the reason we're on this planet is, there is only two iron ore nodes on this planet. And since iron is the absolute ultimate limiter, we will never ever pave over iron. However, say something like titanium ore, yeah, we're, we're never going to care about that. We have, like, just, like, we have more hours of titanium ore consumption that we're ever going to run out of. Like, let's just say my computer would die before we actually run out of titanium. So a bunch of this stuff on this planet, we're just going to pave over everything but these two patches of iron ore, which means we can pretty much cover this entire planet in, uh, in these builds. Well, we'll be able to fit in 19 builds on this planet. But let's say we went with the full 20, plus we can start putting them on other planets as well. These ones here, we haven't hooked them up to anything. Any iron ore we need will be demanded by our towers. They'll just be set to, where is it? Pull down ores from locally and remotely. Everything else is just set to remote demand because they're pulling them from other planets in the system. This planet here only contains these resources. We don't care about the titanium, we don't care about the stone, and the only thing we really care about is that iron ore. Then all we're losing out on is about 5 million copper, 7 million silicon ore, and then the rest of the planetary system is, well, there's 110 million iron ore, uh, 82 million copper, 67 million silicon, 110 titanium, yeah, all this stuff, we're not going to run out. 
Now, let's pop over to a mining planet. This is your basic bog standard mining planet, and I've got a, a blueprint here for placing down this little power top. Ah yeah, this power top here. So basically what we do is we go onto a planet, we line that up at one of the, uh, the poles, and boom, we stick down these six little artificial suns to keep the whole thing powered. It requests down some antimatter fuel rods and some space warpers. Now the space warpers are important for different reasons, but we'll come back to that in a second. Then what we do is we just, well, we place these mines on top of every single patch of ore we can find. When it comes to the iron, we make sure we get every single little note of it because it's the big limiter here. As for the titanium and stuff like that, we might miss a little bit here and there. We don't care so much. And then we just run power poles everywhere. I really should put together a basic blueprint for a planet to cover it in power poles. Just power poles, because f placing down the power poles is probably the most painful part of this entire process. And then once we've finished placing down all the mines on the planet, all you do is, uh, well, you bring up the planetary type, and I take a screenshot of this, and then I just start placing down logistics towers. So, for example, let's just start, I think it's probably starting top right, that's usually, yeah, that's normally how I go. Uh, iron ore, local demand, and it pulls it via these logistic drones from all the mines, directly, and then interstellar logistic vessels ship it out to the planet in system that it needs. And we have no space warpers, because none of this stuff is going anywhere but right here. And... Uh, same thing with the copper, local demand, remote supply. Same thing with the silicon ore. Same thing with the, actually no, coal and stone. We can wait for a second. Sorry, they're the last two. Then we've got the titanium. Then we've got the fire ice. Now, the stone here is not used on this planet. So what we've done is we've just put it to local demand, remote supply, and we've stuck in a bunch of space warpers. We requested them locally, so they're being pulled from the local tower. This means that this stone is now available to the rest of the network, and we'll probably use that later on when we're making solar sails or something like that. Basically, this means that we can feed this into other systems outside of here. We, I'm trying to keep everything as local as possible and just have systems dedicated to stuff. This is coal as well, same thing. It's going to ship this stuff off planet to wherever we need it when the time comes. But this means this whole planet is now, well, configured. The downside will be when we start drawing more and more from this planet that one tower can't keep up. I'll have to notice that and come back and put down more towers. But I have no idea how many towers we're going to need. So for now, I'm just going to put down these. And then when it starts to run out, I'll just go to the opposite side of the planet and put down a bunch more just to spread out the load. And that's pretty much how I've done all my mining setups. Maybe this is the wrong way to do it. Uh, but I definitely know... I need to put together a basically a power pole setup that covers an entire planet so that I can just blueprint it down and it gets built and I don't have to think about running these power poles everywhere because it's an absolute pain in the butt. I'm sure some of them won't be able to get placed down because they'll be overriding resources or things or on liquids, but yeah, I think it'd make my life easier. Figuring out the numbers on this thing starts to get into, uh, it starts to get into staggering levels. Uh, basically, if we built, if we covered this entire planet in 20 of these, we'd be drawing down, whatever, 1.382 gigawatts of power. Big blue over here, this thing can pull down 2.4 terawatts of power at maximum capacity. Also, we have three more, well, two other planets in this system that we can hook this into, which means that's 2.4 multiplied by 3, which is 7.2 terawatts of power we can draw down. So, assuming we can find planets to put our power generation antimatter fuel cell production on, we would need to place down, I mean, 5.2 planets worth? Which is a lot, so we're going to have to cover 5.2 planets in the production necessary to turn all of these photons into power. Uh, yeah, so that is why I spent so much time and effort trying to compactify this down into its little 10 by 10 frame and make it all convenient, because this thing here, we're going to need to build so many of them. And at the same time, they do a wonderful job at like, the amount of power we're going to be able to generate this, or, or portable power is just spectacular. And it, look, let's, let's go back to our real map and demonstrate why this is going to be so useful. This is our real map. You can tell by all of the uh, damaged buildings and stuff. Also, it's much earlier back in time. All right. This place here, we have actually put down the build. I just took the blueprint from inside our test save and we've stamped this out. I mean, yep, it works. It does exactly the same thing it should. And then we, we just stuck down a second one immediately. So this is the other one piled in right beside it. In fact, we have that one tile of space in between them because we have that extra space to work with. At the same time, the blueprint also includes this up here in the pie slice area. As in, it also includes the little power generation things and this tower which pulls down these resources. So the whole thing is sort of integrated. We could have used this other space up here for stuff, but honestly, I could have spent another like 20, 30 hours just playing around with that design and having fun with it and trying to compactify it down or maybe optimize it or maybe take some more of these antimatter things and move them up there and put more buildings in there so we could churn out more. No, at some point I had to stop and say, you know what? It's good enough. It's good enough. So this means we are churning out just um, redundant amounts of power. I don't think it's completely spun up. It should be, I think it's 460 for each one. 
Actually, wait, no, I tell a lie. It's 480 antimatter fuel rods for each one, so 960 it should cap out at, which it just has, which is perfect. Oh, actually, there's a slight drop off there. All right, so now we have lots of power flowing in. And all of that power is, well, we're converting all of the photons we're getting, and all of that is dumping into there where it is already proliferated and good to go. Oh, one thing to note. There's no point proliferating photons because it doesn't work. All it does is give you a production speed up. I thought about doing it, but it's... You, there's just It's a waste of proliferate. Proliferate's going to be one of those things we're going to have to build lots more of as well, so I thought, why waste it on those things considering it does nothing except produce a speed up. Uh, as well as that, when it comes to the antimatter fuel rods, you cannot increase the efficiency of fuel rod production by proliferating the ingredients. You can only get a production speed up. Uh, but we've proliferated pretty much everything else, like all the way from the United States constraint spheres, the fire ice, all that stuff. Yeah, all of that, all of the rest of it, it's all being proliferated. But now let's take this power and use it for something uh, efficiency-wise. There's Big Blue, there's our antimatter fuel cell production, which is nice and local, and over here we have Dyson Chips, which is where we produce all of our Dyson Chips. It's been a while since we've been back at Dyson Chips. How are you guys doing? And... Perfect landing. As you can see, this looks very similar to our, our fuel rod design, just uh, messier, let's just say. I didn't put as much time and effort into this one, but this one works quite well. Plus, it requires so many more resources. This thing... Yeah, this thing was probably the worst thing to start on, but at the same time... Actually, no. It, it kind of taught, taught me a lot building this. As you can tell by the power consumption it does up here, that's a, it's a little bit of a beast. Alright. Let's go, uh... Let's go increase our ship production. This produces 112 ships per minute. Yep, 111 to 112. I should be doing 112. Give me the last hour. What is going on? We're getting some production dips. I bet that's the hydrogen. No? Hydrogen's good. Yeah. I'll have to do some troubleshooting on that in a bit. But for now, uh, let's double production, shall we? Now, where did I put you? You were 112.5 rockets per minute. Black box design. And... Nope, that's the wrong way. That looks more like it. Uh, nope, 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 nope. Will that all fit? Uh, what's getting blocked? Ah, there's a big lump of minerals in the middle, but everything else is fine. One second while we compress those minerals down a little bit. Oh, and um, that immediately started placing. All right, this is gonna take a minute. Uh, this thing has to build, and it takes a little bit of time. At the same time, I'm going to have to go and install the power brick. I never really built in the power brick into this one. I know, sloppy on my part, but it's okay. We've got one over there we can copy real quick. And that's the second one built. We're still waiting on a few resources to arrive, but it's starting to spin up. Uh, there were some questions asked about why, um, why, on God's green earth, am I using miniature particle colliders? Actually, I actually suppose this isn't a green earth, is it? You know what? Sorry, turn a phrase. Whatever. So, why am I using these instead of using fractionators? Well, fractionators just take up more space. Uh, but that's namely it. These are convenient, simple to put down, and hydrogen's one of those resources that's effectively infinitely renewable because you have gas giants you can draw it from. So I figure, why bother using fractionators? Now, you can quad stack fractionators, but even then, these things just work out more space efficient. So you can, like, use giant stacks, or, um, generally we can stack up resources up to four tiles high. Uh, you can see them here. That hydrogen is four tiles high there, and, well, most of them are. Some of the occasional three slips by. But you can do that with fractionators to increase their efficiency, but even then, from my testing, it was just easier to use these. Well, I could be wrong. Uh, I might have messed that up, but, uh, yeah, that's why I'm using those to turn uh, hy hydrogen into deuterium for this build. Now, where is that power? There should be power arriving here shortly. Yeah, there's 2,000 inbound. I should make you sure you have these guys, and I should probably make sure this thing gets down... Yeah, you're gonna need some warpers as well, just to make sure you can... Actually, all of my power production facilities are going to come with warpers and ships. So there's no point getting these guys to have any of that. In fact, yeah, you know what? We'll, we'll take the, even the ships back. There's no point wasting them on you. And the power flows. Excellent. Yeah. I would have thought our sufficiency would be a little bit lower than that. I thought we... Hmm. Something's not drawing as much power as it should. Well, it doesn't matter. That's it. We've managed to double our rocket production from 112 to 224. Okay, well, not quite yet. It's still going to take some time to spin up. It's currently only at 112.6. But, you can see that spike near the end for the last minute. Yeah, much better. At one point, I did say I would make a case for why I think this is a good idea. And this would be the case here. 
like when we doubled up this production, it was rather quick and efficient, and we just chucked down the power there. We don't have to worry about having Dyson spheres. We don't have to mess with anything else. We just have to make sure there's enough space to put down these artificial suns, and they are quite space efficient. But more importantly, it means the scaling up procedure is so much better. Uh, for example, if we check over here, I put in a third one. Yep, so now we have a third one doing it, and also a fourth one. That's the thing. You just copy, paste, copy, paste. Done. So one of these, now it takes a little bit of time for these to spin up, namely because I think the bottleneck is magnets. Uh, based on this design, we need 5.9 of these magnet furnaces. So we're not actually producing quite, well, we produce as much magnets as we need, but they have to backfill the system. So where are they? Yeah, these green motors over here get a little bit starved because some of those magnets run, or, well, damn it. It's to do with the electromagnets, they get a little bit starved, which starves the green motors, which means it takes a little bit of time to backfill everything. So right now, we've got 406, 407, but if you go back over the last 10 minutes, it's 368. It's just slowly ramping up until all of them will be producing 112 apiece. So we should expect that to hit about 450 at some point. Only risky thing is the hydrogen. I think I'm going to have to do some more research on our ships. Namely because we need a lot of hydrogen. Uh, that one's fine. You can see there's actually plenty of hydrogen flowing out. Uh, that one there is almost dry. Occasionally some of them will run dry because the ships have to go out, grab the hydrogen and come back. It's because they're taking it from hydrogen gas giants and hydrogen gas giants can't hold any ships. See, same again. Will you actually get it in time? Like all of the ships, literally every single ship is currently active right now. And yeah, this is the problem. If we had faster ships, this wouldn't be an issue. Or we could sit down extra... Yeah, add... Yeah, we'll see. I think that's what's actually causing the little bit of uh, inconsistencies in this. Like, we are just mouling through that hydrogen. It's a really, really good thing that the closest hydrogen thing is this gas giant right there. That was sort of accidental. I didn't prioritize that, but I think it should be a good high priority for this design or this build. It is incredibly hydrogen hungry. Uh, one other downside is I gave these guys warpers, which means they might be warping to faraway planets to get that hydrogen. Uh, you know what? Who cares? We now have masses and masses of rockets being produced, which is good, because there's a use for those rockets. And that use is big blue over here. Come on, come on. Yep. Messed up the landing. Now, big blue is currently launching a whole bunch of solar sails and should be launching a whole bunch of rockets. The thing is, we were not producing enough rockets to keep up with the rocket silos, which is good. We don't ever want to be producing enough rockets. No, wait, no. We don't want to ever have so few silos that they can't keep up with our rocket production, would be a more accurate assessment. And we have zero rockets in band because, well, it only does them in batches of 2,000. But that's... that's fine. Uh, one thing is, though, I think we need to increase the solar cell launchers because if we check under the Dyson Sphere here, all the sails are being absorbed instantly, which is... Good, I suppose. I think what's happened is we finally caught up with having enough nodes for the solar sails to attach to. Uh, as in... Whoop. These things over here, once they're, I think, I can't remember if it's 10 or 20% complete, solar sails can then start entering and start filling out the, uh, the node associated with it. So since enough of those are now filled out, every single one of them can then have 120 uh, solar sails that can attach to each one of them. However, it takes time for them to transport. So you'll notice there's... Where is it? Yeah, there's the solar cells heading over here. The solar sails, sorry, not solar cells. Solar sails hit over here and then they go to the nearest nodes. And the thing is, the nodes nearby are going to be doing great. See, for example, this one here has. attaching 88, 80. Like, the sails get here so quickly that it's keep able to drain a constant supply out of the incoming sails. But the ones that are on, say, the far side over there, like, uh, uh, that one. Say, that one. has 21 attaching. Oh my god. How is that so few? I think we need a lot more solar sail launchers. However, rockets-wise, to actually build the frame, we have now pretty much almost quadrupled production. We had a, another little rocket sail, rocket ship production facility on another planet, which we're probably going to decommission in a bit, because we can scale up an awful lot. And this is going to allow us to get more power, which allows us to generate more photons, which allows us to produce more ships. And that scales up a lot. Now, let me put down a few more guns. That is 50% more guns for 50% more solar sail launches. Uh, it'll take a while for that to kick in, but... Oof, and ships have arrived to start filling in those nodes. We might want to start adding an extra layer to our Dyson Sphere.
I wouldn't actually, do we? I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of nodes that aren't finished out. How many we got left? Planned 195,000 rocket ships. Constructed 119,000. Yeah, I think we can we can wait a little time before we actually add on an extra layer. The only reason we'd need an extra layer is so that the solar sails have somewhere else to attach to. We're going to need to, well, up solar sail production as well, most likely, though. Do we have enough guns? Oh my god, that's beautiful. The amount of ships. That is awesome. Actually, what is our current production capacity for ships? We're consuming 952 per minute. Ha. Huh. So we can consume about a thousand? Which means we need about another six rocket production facilities back on that other planet. Uh, let's check entire star cluster. We are producing 500. Yeah. We're going to need more, aren't we? But I think we've got enough power to run that many. Like, that's sort of the joy. We can just go back and chuck down a bunch more and really start piling into this. Like, we have all the infrastructure necessary now. Actually, let me check the power requirements. My numbers tell me that uh, those little rocket production facilities, the ones that churn out 112.5, they consume about 1,200 megawatts. Well, 1,062.8 megawatts. We're going to round it up to 1,200 megawatts because, you know, there's going to be mining costs, transport costs, there's all that stuff in it. So just say we round it up to that. But one of our little power production facilities that produces 480 antimatter fuel cells, that's, well, 69,000 megawatts. So we can run about 57 rocket facilities with one of our antimatter production facilities. However, it depends on how many photons we're producing as well. Uh, let's see. We're looking at the entire star cluster. I would just like to look at this system. So Big Blue 1 is producing about 2,400 critical photons. My numbers tell me we need about 2,880 of them to run one of our antimatter fuel cell production facilities. Now this is going to keep going up, of course. Reason being, well, we're launching more rockets and we're launching more solar sails. So this should just constantly be going up and up and up. In fact, this just stabilized it for the last 10 minutes. So 2,400. Right. Put that over the last hour. 200 and like. It's gone from 2,170 to the last minute, it's got up to 2,400. And now that we've cranked all those rockets into the mix, it's going to start rising even faster. So, I suppose it's time to go back and chuck down another six rocket production facilities, maybe? Yeah, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Actually, wait, no, 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 I can do that off screen. There's one other thing I want to do that I've been meaning to test out for ages. And it's basically a defense system for planets. Uh, I'll build one here really quickly, and then we'll transfer it to the ones that I want to put it on. This here is, well, a cannon top. What it does is, we put a bunch of plasma turrets here, each one of them is set to upper air, so relay stations. Basically, if a relay station tries to come to a planet, and we've got one of these on the top and the bottom, I'm hopefully it'll kill them. I tried putting smaller versions of these around the place with just one or two turrets. It didn't seem to work out very well, but this, I think this one might actually work. Now, I think I'm going to restrict these to only do, where is it? Yeah, outgoing inter... Yeah, this should be restricted to one. Otherwise, it's going to draw too much resources. This has got 2,000 shots on the line. We don't want that. I think we were restricted to one. That means we need to have one lump of power coming out, one lump of uh, shots coming out, and this whole thing should work just fine. And it can also fit a few towers on the inside if you need to tech up on stuff. Power-wise, pretty good as well. Simple, efficient, one on each top on the bottom of the plummet. I'm hoping it will shoot down all relay stations before they can land. Now let's go test this out somewhere. Somewhere preferably aggressive. You see, one thing that's been annoying me is these farms. They've been having a great time. They've been shooting ships. They've been, you know, getting us the resources we want. They're awesome. However, there's this guy over here. You see, since we don't protect the planet, other farms land, and then every so often someone builds up a raid, and then it attacks, and then we get notifications, and then it's just, it's just annoying. So instead, what we're going to do is, well, we're going to put the, sh the defensive turret up here and the defensive turret up here. Now, in theory, they shouldn't shoot the ones that have landed because they won't have the angle to get to them. But anything new that tries to land, I'm hopeful that any more of these relay stations that shall land here will get blasted out of the sky before they can even get close. I don't know if this will work, but it's something I want to test. Right, while I was putting this together, uh, things looking good. Total power generation of the cluster's power grid reaches 50 gigawatts. We're still a little bit low, but, you know, we're getting up there. We're getting there. Actually, before this stuff arrives, I'd like to drive off this guy. I'm just worried that the moment the shells arrive, they're going to start blasting that thing out of the sky. Which, well, we kind of want to keep it alive for testing purposes. Damn it. Oh, yeah, that's... That's a lot of explosive force in those things. Well, you know what, that's enough. Now, we just make sure this guy leaves. Uh, bye-bye now. 
Oh, seriously. And he's gone. Perfect. Now we'll just make sure this thing launches. Hey, should you be leaving? And let's make sure he leaves safely. He shouldn't come in range of the bottom towers. Oh, wait. No, they're not shooting at him. I was expecting him to blast him before he could even get... Did they? Damn it! I should have looked closer. You know what? Doesn't matter. The theory will be that what will happen is ships will try to land here, and then before they can get in range, they get blasted by multiple plasma turrets. And since there's one on the top and one on the bottom, there should be no way for them to get close enough. The problem is these things only have a, an angle of attack radius, or an angle of attack that they can shoot up and down on, or pitch limit, 0 to 80 degrees. So it really depends how it comes at them. My hope is that this setup is perfect and we never have to worry about anything landing. Whether or not that's true, I suppose we'll find out. This planet here, it used to be a farm, but what happened is, at one point I accidentally had left my fleet on, I came here and I destroyed the, well, relay station that was powering that base over there. So currently, what I have done is I have placed uh, turrets on top of farm 2, farm th system 3, and made sure that no, well, hopefully no hives can land there, which means all the hives should try and land here, or they'll try and land there and get blown up, hopefully. I just want to do this for testing purposes, because it would be nice if we had a system where we could defend planets without having to cover them in shielding. These shields, they require a lot of power, but it's more just a case of, that's just a lot of effort, and you got to place them everywhere, and that seems like trouble. Instead, just put a bunch of guns at the top of your planet, both ends, and done. Problem solved. Hopefully. One thing I finally wanted to check out as well, uh, basically our production. I want to make sure that we're not going to be bottlenecked on anything. One of the reasons we spent all this time producing this, well, weird looking mall, is so that we can produce all of the stuff we're going to need for this high end late game junk. Now, uh, for example, we're going to need a lot of recomposing assemblers and negatropy smelters. Like these things here require a lot of high end resources. For example, these guys require. Yeah, negatropy singularities and energy shards, which seem to be running low. No? What are you missing? Ah. Yeah, it's the negatropy singularity stuff that they're missing. Awkward. We do have a lot of stuff going on, and these guys, yeah, these guys are pumping out lots and lots of uh, these guyos, the plasma capsules. They're what's going to run the the plasma tops on top of our planets that basically protect them from incoming drops. Theoretically, of course, we still haven't tested that fully. Uh, what's, the, what's the power generation on this thing? It's a mere 36.5 gigawatts. This is the maximum size Dyson Sphere we can make around this planet. Now, you can build multiple layers, but this is the largest layer we were possible building, and it's only got 35.1 gigawatts. I think we're at 70 or 80 already on the uh, the Dyson we're making around Big Blue, and that's only going to ins accelerate in terms of uh, power generation because we've just brought online so much stuff. And now we're going to use all of these resources to crank us up to at least a thousand rockets per minute. If we're not doing a thousand rockets per minute, What's even the point of trying to build a max-sized Dyson Sphere? So, I'm gonna have to put down about five, six more of these, uh, rocket deployment facilities. Yeah, I think I'll do that stuff off-screen. I think we've got enough done for one day. That design kinda broke my brain breaking it, but I think it was worth it. Getting those antimatter fuel cells consistently produced is just going to be so much handier. We're gonna have to build, like, if, if building ten of these seems a little bit daunting, it, it, it's not. Now, what's more daunting is we're gonna have to build an awful, awful lot more of the antimatter fuel rod production. Now, twenty of them is not enough. We're gonna need about sixty or seventy of those by the time we're finished. So, you know, I figured, why not just cut out the middleman and make sure it's well done at the start? Oh, and when I'm building these, what I like to do is make sure that guy gets built first. That draws down the proliferate Mark III, and then that proliferate Mark III can then flow along the rails and hopefully get down before everything else does. Anyway, I'm going to cut this out here. I'm going to do a bunch of building in the background. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Good luck. Thank you.